Hi everyone, Ollie here. Welcome back to the channel once again. This is going to be the vlog video for week four of year two at Warwick Medical School. And I'm sorry this is so late. Actually, having my clinical placements be on a Monday now is making the uh, Sunday recordings and uploads really, really difficult because I can't really upload from the house very easily at the moment. I have to do it from uni where the connection is a lot better. But now I'm recording on a Sunday. I'm not in uni at all on a Monday. So it's probably going to be Tuesday when these are uploaded. This one's being recorded the following Wednesday, just because I've had no time at all. But I'm just going to jump straight in. So the Monday of this week was really, really cool because I had my first ever surgical induction. And what that basically means, well, actually, I'm not entirely sure what it means. I was told that I had to go and get a surgical induction, but was provided no guidance or information on exactly what that meant. So I rocked up to the kind of surgery wing bit of George Eliot Hospital um, just trying to go and get an induction whatever that meant and um, I was sent to the orthopedics ward which is really cool I thought exciting specialty let's go jump in see some orthopedics so I, I go along to the orthopedics unit not really sure what I'm supposed to be doing and I hang about for like 10-15 minutes we had to be in at 8 that morning so it's now maybe quarter past 20 past 8 um, I have no idea what's going on, have never been in a surgical theatre before, I've seen lots of video and things obviously of surgical procedures, but never been in there. And you're in that situation where everyone's kind of ignoring you, I wasn't really sure what to do, but I did kind of find a nurse who was sat in one of the offices and kind of explained, look, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to be doing here, but I've got this green form that I need someone to eventually sign and say that I've had a surgical induction. and. This nurse was so, so nice to me and I actually want to talk a lot about that because in that situation we're now sort of starting our clinical time, our clinical part of the course. We really, I think, have yet to find our feet on the wards. We still, or I keep saying we, I still feel very much like a nuisance when I turn up somewhere unannounced because I can't really do anything useful. Um, you know, even if you're trying to attach yourself to an F1, I think they'd rather you weren't there. Um, you kind of feel in the way like a bit of a useless ornament but anyway this nurse she just looked after me so well she said all right you know calm down come with me um, here is where you get changed here's where you can leave your stuff this is the surgeon that you need to speak to he's really nice this is where you need to go so go get changed um, put all your clothes in here come meet me back here and then I'll take you into theatre and just having that nurse, having someone there who was willing to just take the few seconds that it took to make sure I was okay and kind of steer me in the right direction turned what I think could have been a very awkward and unpleasant experience into something that I really enjoyed. And one of my colleagues um, turned up as well. So we both got changed, got scrubbed up and then we went into theatre. So we got to see a patient come in to be anaesthetised and the consultant anaesthetist and his registrar were in there and they uh, were doing nerve blocks before before the operations so they were both um, foot operations the guy we were with is a foot surgeon so he was quizzing us you know what what nerves supply this territory like what are the five nerves supplying the ankle and quizzing us and we got some of them right and then um, he'd show us on ultrasound doing the nerve block explaining what he was doing and just giving us some really good career advice as well. He talked about taking an F3 year, the importance of that. So what that means is after you do your medical school to get licensed in the UK, you have to do your F1 and F2 foundation years. And then after that, you can apply to specialty training. But what an increasing number of people are doing now is taking an F3 year and uh, using it to work on projects or even just working or doing something else for a year and making the decision as to whether medicine is really what they want to do. And he said something to that effect as well. Be sure that medicine is what you want to carry on with. Just because you've gone through medical school, it doesn't mean you have to become a doctor. There are other things you can do, particularly with the contracts getting worse. Um, and I thought it was just really good, friendly advice. So then we got into theatre. We got to see one very quick operation, a quick sort of toe clear out of some inflamed tissue and then an ankle fusion I think was the second thing we got to see um, and my friend Chris has described this process before or orthopedics in general as moist carpentry which I think very well describes what we saw it was all like power tools and hammers and chisels and drills and scrapers and 
what we were essentially watching was it sort of looked like a toothbrush if you imagine like an electric toothbrush but it would scrape off cartilage because they went arthroscopically so two big holes into the ankle camera in big bone scrapery thing in and he was inside the joint the surgeon scraping off excess cartilage out of the ankle joint space and you could see it all on one of the camera monitors and sort of wiggling it around and saying to us you know what bone is this which way am i facing and it was really really difficult to understand what was going on and there was blood and bits of bone and saline solution and just shit everywhere <laughs> and it was really really exciting you know for, for the first thing that i ever saw it was really dynamic and cool and uh, i got a bit freaked out because they do the who checklists and I, I know about who surgical checklists you sort of go through who the patient is what procedure they're expecting who everyone is on the team and um, because me and emma my uh, course mate were in there we had to be part of the who checklist as well and the the nurse who was kind of leading um the checklist sort of was going around saying oh i'm um the anesthetist i'm the nurse i'm the surgeon or whatever and then she sort of looks at me to carry on and i'm looking at her like what what do you want me to do she's like can i say your name you're the medical student it's like oh ollie medical student and it was just like one of those moments where because it because it's such a new environment and a bit weird i was a bit kind of bewildered but it was it was weirdly inclusive that's all i want to say all the staff in there were making sure we could see looking after us telling us what not to walk into because we weren't sterile um it's like don't touch anything blue and i did touch something blue i accidentally bumped my head on the x-ray machine so it had to be recovered with a new sterile thing but thankfully they were okay with it <laughs> So that was my surgical induction. Then in the afternoon, I had uh, bedside teaching. I think it was my first round of bedside teaching for AC1. And uh, the doctor there was also a really nice young clinical education fellow. I think had switched training programs. So it switched from peds to GP, I think. And um, again, he gave us the same advice unprompted about taking an F3 year and the value of doing that. And that's something I really want to pay attention to because I was one of those people, as I'm sure many of you are, and loads of people are, particularly when it comes to medical applicants, um, you want to rush through everything and get through everything as quickly as possible, get into med school on your first try, get through it as quickly as possible, become a consultant. And it, it's just, since coming to med school, I very much want the pace of things to slow down. And actually the prospect of taking a year out between F2 and actually starting a training scheme sounds great, particularly if it allows me to do more projects and things like that. There is really no rush. So Tuesday was a bit of a milestone for me in AC1 because all of us in the year or everyone that I've spoken to at least, it seems like we're really busy all the time, maybe busier than we've ever been. Despite having fewer lectures, we might only have seven or eight lectures a week compared to the seven or eight lectures a day that the first years are getting. The pace is low, but it seems like we're doing a lot more. And I feel like it's because we're probably taking on projects, starting research, taking on more committee roles, things like that. Um, we're starting to shape the actual career progression, I think, a bit more. So it, it feels very flustering. And I think virtually all of us have, have found that finding the motivation to keep working at the level we should be working is really hard to find at the moment because we hit that kind of peak before the summer where you were living and breathing medicine for like a couple of months before the exams you were doing literally nothing else and I think well I know how exhausting that was and just actually getting ourselves to just get plugging away steadily at it again has been really hard but Tuesday I managed to just sit down for a solid four or five hours and crank out a load of lecture notes getting my Anki up to deck up to deck up to date and um, that's something that hasn't actually happened and that was in week four of AC1 so it does just take a bit of time to recalibrate yourself and that's normal I've, I've spoken to older students about that and they seem to think that's perfectly normal on Wednesday, we didn't do an awful lot again. I remember we had CBL, um, and this was actually a case that's based around what we think is tuberculosis, which goes along with some of the teaching we've had, and it's a really interesting condition. In AC1, we cover it 
a few of the more advanced or atypical conditions that they can't cram into the first year. TB is one of them, and um, we talk about cancer a bit more, but um, TB is a really interesting presentation. You get quite characteristic x-ray signs, um, hemoptysis, signs of pneumonia, and um, we had to talk a lot about things like deprivation of liberty safeguards as well, because TB highly infectious in its active form. And we were saying, you know, if a patient, I think the patient's homeless in the case, if they come in and you suspect they've got TB, um, highly infectious, very, very dangerous, and you can't confirm a diagnosis of TB really without the microscopy and culturing from their sputum sample, and that can take weeks and weeks to culture the mycobacterium that causes it. But you've got to start treatment immediately, regardless of that, just with some sort of antibiotic. But the question is, can you detain someone in hospital if you think they're going to leave and not take their medication because they're a massive infection risk uh, to other people and TB can quite easily kill people. And uh, in the evening, I remember we messed around with Surgeon Simulator a bit before by a studio called Bossa Studios. It's really weird. Um, you play it with a keyboard and mouse, you control one arm of a surgeon sort of in various axes, you can raise and lower it and stuff, and you, you have to do an increasingly complex set of operations. The first one is a heart transplant, we, we were at it for two or three hours, we didn't get past the first operation, it's so hard. I genuinely think that doing a heart transplant in real life is easier than doing one in Search and Simulator. But it's really funny, if you're medically inclined, it's on Steam and a load of other gaming platforms, do give it a go. Thursday was really quite interesting because I did unfortunately sleep in late and miss the first lecture. My sleep's been a bit haywire recently, but I did make it in in time for a lecture on homelessness by Dr. Susan Rutherford. Yeah, I just had to double check the name because I want to get that right. But she set up a homeless night shelter in Leamington Spa, which is one of those amazing things that some people, you know, that they get these achievements and it's just like, wow, like I get to share the same plane of existence as you. An amazing thing, she came in and gave this talk with a patient about, basically the core message of it was don't prejudge certain vulnerable groups, treat, treat everyone as if they're a patient that needs to be treated, particularly people like intravenous drug users, homeless populations. You need to treat them and do their best to treat their whole situation because they raise more issues like compliance, their own safety, infection risk to others. Um, and it was just one of those things that I'm really glad I got to go and see because I think it will, for the short like hour-long presentation that it was, it's one of those things that will affect my viewpoint going forward and I think I'll remember it for a long time. Then in the afternoon we had a problem and diag... Then in the afternoon we had a problem solving and diagnosis session. So what you had to do, it was a bit of a weird activity, but you were given a set of like presenting complaints and a bit of a patient history. And you had to write down say five conditions that you thought it might be. So I think they had shortness of breath or something. So it was like COPD, uh, pulmonary embolism, MI, things like that. And you had to rank them in the most, in the order of likelihood, basically. Most likely at the top, least likely at the bottom. Then the history would change slightly or you'd get a bit more information about them. And then you'd sort of re-rank uh, your order or you could add new suggestions based on the new information. And this was iterated four or five times. So you were constantly re-ranking your priorities or adding more and more options until eventually, I think we got pneumothorax or something. Um, uh, as our most likely option and that was the diagnosis. Um, so that was a really good activity just to make you think on your feet a little bit. Not a lot happened really towards the weekend. Um, I bought a diary on Friday because I thought, you know, I, I think I really need a diary planner. I've been using an online one but it's just not been doing it for me. I'd rather have something tangible. So I bought a diary in an attempt to sort of sort my life out turns out to be a vain attempt because what I've bought is not an academic diary, it's just a diary. And what that means is it starts in January and it ends in December. It's currently the middle of October, so I have a good two and a bit months of useful diary left, one of which isn't useful because I'm not at the medical school in December. We're actually, we have the time off those four weeks. So 
it was a complete waste of my time and money. I've ordered an academic one, hopefully I will do it properly this time. And Saturday and Sunday were pretty, pretty lazy really. Um, what I have been doing recently, and I figure I should talk about this now, but because the weekend was pretty lazy, that actually gives me a chance to talk about something that I'm really excited to tell you about. I don't think I've talked about it here on the channel yet. I'm in the process of organising um, a conference, essentially, or a, an event day. I'm not sure what the appropriate title for it is, but what we are doing, and as I say we, I'm doing this in conjunction with a bunch of my course mates, is we are providing a free multiple mini interview prep day to kids or school kids so A-level leavers from disadvantaged Coventry postcode schools basically so we're trying to target those areas that essentially could not afford to pay for the Kaplan courses of oh, that's just an example but the, the paid MMI interview uh, day courses that you can go on they can cost up to several hundred pounds for a day or a weekend of training and we think basically that those sort of models just price a certain demographic or multiple certain demographics out of the market completely and the, the playing field is therefore not as level as it could be to put it mildly the people that probably need those resources the most have absolutely no means to afford them and and i say this obviously from the perspective of like a white middle class guy because when i was applying you know i thought then jesus i'm not spending like 300 pounds on mmi training or whatever and i was saying that from my you know relatively privileged position but my own experience um being in the hospitals and the healthcare settings particularly in this area around birmingham and coventry it's so ridiculously multicultural and I think that's an amazing thing um, when you look at all the the range of professionals that we have like even when I was in the operating theatre I reckon that virtually everyone in there there were maybe 10 12 people in the theatre was from a different sort of ethnic or international background but then when you look at medical school admissions it's sort of overwhelmingly white middle class private school the same things you would always expect Basically, what I want to show is that it's possible to do free events like this and provide them to the people that need them the most so we can we can get that more reflective medical population together. And I just want to show that it can be done through goodwill of existing students, that they don't need to be paying hundreds of pounds for tuition. So what we're going to do is everyone's going to get a free go through a, an MMI circuit. They're going to get feedback in the circuit. One thing I'm really keen to do is have video recordings of everyone's stations so they can get the feedback later. We'll have a few speakers, some events they can go to, put on a free lunch, cover transport, basically make it a nice day and this is going to be done through the goodwill of students completely free. It's going to be at the beginning of December. Unfortunately this is a big thing, it's not going to be an open event and um, we're targeting it at specifically these schools if there are any free places they'll be open very short notice um, because I do really want to prioritize that group of people because they're the ones that need it it's something that I hope will become an annual event I think it will go down really well if we can pull it off I'm in the process of securing funding for everything at the moment but the med school's on board and I'm really looking forward to it there'll be plenty of coverage on the day so you guys can see what we get up to if you'd like to help out as well in any way, do let me know. Just send me an email or go to my website, postgradmedic.com, and use the contact form there. I'm estimating running costs of about £1,000, and I think it's going to need approximately 60 students to make this day work. But if it works and all my maths works out, we're going to be able to put about 96 students, just shy of 100, through this process. They'll have a good day, and hopefully it will help them make that jump to medical school. So that's what I've been up to this week guys, thanks very much for watching, please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe and don't forget to go and check out postgradmedic.com for more free videos just like this one and my daily blog of med school life here at Warwick Medical School on the Graduate Entry Programme. Take care, I'll see you soon.